Hi, I'm John. Welcome to Premium Builds. In this video, we're going to test the two real-world flagship cards from AMD and NVIDIA, the RTX 3080 and the RX 6800 XT. I think it's only right that we start this review with a bit of an explanation, not only around the delay to this review, but also around the situation regarding GPUs as a whole. Both of these cards were bought by us for this review and via normal channels. We didn't get sent them. Therefore, we're all too painfully aware of the scarcity of GPUs on the general market, and that's part of the reason for the delay to this review. The other reason is, like many people, I've been working from home, and that entails much more childcare than actual work. I haven't been able to find the time to produce the kind of content that I know you guys expect. And please also keep an eye out on premiumbuilds.com. We're making some major revisions to that website and adding a whole bunch of functionality to make it a fantastic resource for anyone looking to build a PC. Of course, the global pandemic is one of the driving factors behind both restricted supply and also heightened demand of GPUs. On the one hand, production lines have been hit by supply shortage and global supply chains have been disrupted. On the other hand, with more people working from home or looking for means to entertain themselves, demand has skyrocketed. AMD in particular are struggling to produce sufficient GPUs on the 7 nanometer production lines alongside the console APUs and Zen 3 CPUs that all vie for limited capacity at TSMC's foundries. Finally, of course, cryptocurrency mining has again come to the fore, with miners buying up gaming GPUs in bulk to mine Ethereum. We all know the results of this. The cards I'm reviewing now sell via side channels for two to three times their launch MSRP and are near impossible to buy via normal retail channels. I'm going to keep this review straight down the line. You might be prepared to pay for either card and want to know the kind of performance you're going to get. It might be that you're looking to substitute one card for the other because that's what availability is near you, and therefore whether you're missing out by not getting your preferred choice. This review simply seeks to answer the question, how do these cards perform? Because it's impossible to answer the question, are these cards worth your money, until such time as the market stabilises and they become available at anywhere close to their suggested retail pricing. Firstly, let's remind ourselves of the stats of these cards that matter. AMD's RX 6800 XT uses their new RDNA2 architecture, fabricated on TSMC's 7 nanometer process. It ships with 16GB of GDDR6 VRAM, accessible across a 256-bit bus. Features include hardware ray tracing cores, smart access memory, and an auto or overclock rage mode. It draws around 300 watts under load. The NVIDIA RTX 3080 uses the Ampere architecture fabricated by Samsung on their 8N process. It has 10GB of GDDR6X memory, which is manufactured under exclusive license by Micron and is accessed across a 320-bit bus. This makes it very high performance. It also has hardware ray tracing via Ampere's second generation RTX cores, tensor cores, and it can utilize DLSS to upscale image resolution. NVIDIA have recently implemented resizable bar or rebar to allow direct memory access in the same manner as AMD's smart access memory. It draws around 340 watts of power under load. It's not possible to make a direct comparison between the numbers of shader units or the core clock speeds between these two cards. The difference in architecture makes such comparisons meaningless. You can directly compare the two memory configurations. The NVIDIA memory configuration, that 10 gigabytes of GDDR6X, is undoubtedly faster and higher performance. However, it's lower capacity, with 6 gigabytes less than the standard GDDR6 of the RDNA2 RX 6800 XT. We tested both these GPUs on the same test bench. Our test bench system comprises of a Ryzen 5800X CPU with PBO enabled but no additional overclocking. It runs 16 gigabytes of 3600 MHz CL16 RAM and has a 1 terabyte Sabrent Rocket 4 NVMe SSD. It's powered by a Fractal Design Ion 860 watt platinum power supply to ensure adequate power. The motherboard is a B550M Mortar Wi-Fi. First, let's take a look at some synthetic benchmarks. Running through the 3 d Mark suite of benchmarks, we can see that in both of the straight gaming relevant tests, the 6800 XT has the upper hand. In Firestrike, which is a 1080p rendered DirectX 11 based test, the RX 6800 turns in an absolutely stellar performance, with a score of nearly 53,000. That's over 10,000 points, or 20% ahead of the RTX 3080, an impressive achievement indicating very high performance in titles using DirectX 11 and running at 1080p. TimeSpy, which uses a more recent DirectX 12 API and renders at 1440p, also shows a slight advantage to the RX 6800 XT, although the margin here is reduced to 1000 points or about 5%. Port Royal is a new benchmark that uses DirectX 12 Ultimate to assess the GPU's hardware ray tracing, and both cards run this benchmark fine. The RTX 3080 with its second generation RTX cores clearly has better performance, by about 1800 points or 20%. 
I've included the score of the RTX 2080 Ti here as well for reference, showing how closely the RX 6800 XT matches the performance of Nvidia's last gen ray tracing tech. Although this score is an aggregate of rasterized and ray tracing performance, and without a score breakdown it's impossible to ascertain how much of that is core rendering performance, and how much of it is the ray tracing component. Nonetheless, it's not fair to say that the RX 6800 XT is poor at ray tracing, simply that it can only use DirectX 12 Ultimate, and that it's not at Ampere's performance levels. As a quick test of the relative 3D rendering performance, we ran Blender 2.83's benchmark renders, BMW 27 and Classroom. Blender has a range of rendering options depending on the GPU used, and we tested cards in all compatible modes to get an idea of how they perform. The RTX 3080 can use CUDA or Optics acceleration, whilst the RX 6800 XT can only use OpenCL. The results aren't favourable for the RX 6800 XT. The BMW render takes it 39 seconds to the 3080's 11 seconds, whilst the classroom scene takes 74 seconds to the RTX 3080's 41. The optics rendering pipeline uses tensor cores to accelerate the process, and it's dramatically faster. Even the RTX 2060 KO matches the RX 6800 XT in BMW 27 using the optics renderer versus OpenCL, although the RX 6800 XT is much faster at the classroom render. Overall, if you are intending in using these cards for productivity purposes, it pays to look closely at uh, benchmarks specific to the applications you're going to use them in. It may be that a more readily available or cheaper card from Nvidia matches the performance in the 6800 XT for the tasks you want to perform. Specifically, an RTX 3060 may be a great option with 12GB of VRAM and an Ampere core. Those features would make it seem an excellent choice for a content creator on a budget, provided you can find one anywhere near to MSRP. Moving on to games and first-person shooters, we've grouped the results here on a per-game basis to simplify comparison and to assist you in looking at the results for the games that particularly interest you. Our first test is Call of Duty Warzone. We run a 5-6 to six minute battle royale, but against bots because it's the only way to make the test repeatable and reliable. We use high settings throughout. We can see that the two cards are relatively evenly matched. The RX 6800 XT has a very slight advantage at 1080p, but just 10 frames per second at 250fps isn't a noticeable difference. At 1440p and 1440p ultrawide they're absolutely equal. At 4K the 3080 has a slight advantage, ahead 9 frames per second at 128 frames per second. We haven't included other metrics to keep the chart legible, but the minimum, maximum and 1% and 0.1% lows are almost identical too. Wherever we don't mention them is because there's nothing worth mentioning. Call of Duty Warzone doesn't appear to have any particular preference, and you'll have an equivalent experience on either card. Rainbow Six Siege is a much faster paced title, and it shows in the benchmarks and the frame rates these cards develop. Here the RX 6800 XT takes a commanding lead at both 1080p and 1440p, it's around 10% faster. Initially we felt this might be down to the rendering pipelines of the 3080 being optimised for higher resolutions, but Hardware Unboxed and others have highlighted interesting discrepancies in the Ampere card's performance when CPU limited. It appears their drivers have a higher overhead, and as such it can dent the performance potential of the GPU. This game presents the most CPU limited test we run outside of Flight Simulator, and as such it may be that one or both of these effects prevents the RTX 3080 from performing. It might also go some way to explaining that stellar 3D Mark Firestrike result at the start of this review. Again, at 1440p ultrawide we see that performance is about equal, and at 4K the RTX 3080 has taken the lead, with 304 frames per second to 239 for the RX 6800 XT. Lastly, Doom Eternal is a well-optimised title using the Vulkan API. It scales very well with both hardware and settings. We're running at Ultra Nightmare here. We see a slight lead for the RX 6800 XT at 1080p, with 409 frames per second to 384 for the RTX 3080, but at all other resolutions the two GPUs perform identically on average. Looking at the underlying statistics however, 1% and 0.1% lows are significantly lower for the RX 6800 XT, indicating a less consistent experience, and this occurs at every resolution. This isn't something we see in the other first person shooters where the results for these metrics are closely matched, we're only mentioning it because it's an anomaly in this case. Moving on then to AAA titles, this is where we expect to see these high end GPUs really shine. Red Dead Redemption 2 still ranks amongst the most demanding and impressive looking titles available, and again it uses the Vulkan API. Here we've run it at very high settings, near ultra, but with a couple of performance tweaks such as water being reduced to medium for a representative experience. Across the board these two GPUs perform near identically, exceeding 100 frames per second at 1080p, close to 100 frames per second at 1440p, and exceeding 60 frames per second in 4K. Both provide a top tier experience, which is what you'd hope for a flagship card. Shadow of the Tomb Raider always impresses us not only with its graphics, but also with its consistency in benchmarks. It reliably highlights very minor changes in system configuration or performance. At highest settings the numbers generated between these two cards are spookily similar, 
and not just in the average frame rates, but in the rest of the metrics as well. The experience on either card is identical, with one caveat. You can't enable RTX shadows or DLSS on the RX 6800 XT. However, in this title and with these GPUs, this is a moot point as you don't need either of those technologies for either visual improvements or performance. It's a dead heat in this title. Finally, we'll take a look at Microsoft Flight Sim 2020. This title continues to receive updates that fix bugs and improve performance, and it's certainly a demanding test of the whole system. Our benchmark run is a four-minute AI-piloted flight from LaGuardia over Manhattan at 2,500 feet, a worst-case scenario and highly demanding of the CPU as well as the GPU. Indeed, it's the CPU that limits the ultimate frame rate here, and even at low settings, 65 frames per second average is the absolute best performance that can be obtained in this test. At more realistic and rewarding high settings, we can see how little the frames per second scale with such powerful GPUs. At 1080p, 1440p, and even 1440p ultrawide, we achieve the same results, at around 60 frames per second. We're mostly CPU limited. At 4K, we start to see the impact of a demanding resolution and settings even on these cards. High settings sees 45 to 47 frames per second in 4K on both, whilst ultra settings cuts performance to just over 30 frames per second for both cards. Just a quick comment on the RX 6800 XT results here. I've not been able to get it to perform as it should at 1080p and even 1440p on ultra settings. You can see those results are a little low, stuck around 45 frames per second. And that's not a CPU limitation, as the 3080 does much better. I've tried driver refreshes and multiple tweaks, but it's just not performing to its potential here. Nevertheless, I'd not recommend you use such an expensive and overpowered GPU to run this title at 1080p, or even 1440p in any event, so it's not particularly relevant but it is an interesting counter to the assumption that the RX 6800 XT should perform better in these circumstances, owing to lower driver overhead, or because of larger VRAM capacity. The lesson here is how important balancing the whole system to the target resolution is in Flight Sim 2020, as well as settings needing to be tweaked for optimum performance. Both of these cards are capable of playing Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 at high resolutions, a mix of high and ultra settings, and both are more than capable of an acceptable VR experience as well. So what are our conclusions? As you'd hope and expect, both of these GPUs turn in an excellent performance. There's nothing that they won't run well. Having spent over a month of testing and general use with both of these cards, they are truly equal in performance in our opinion. There are some games and corner cases where one outperforms the other, but the differences are infrequent and slight. It's really in feature set and versatility where we see the RTX 3080 offer more to a prospective buyer. RTX and DLSS may or may not be the next big thing for gaming, but it's nice to have the option, and in many titles it just isn't there if you've got the AMD card. We hope that developers will use DirectX 12 Ultimate API to bring hardware ray tracing to the broadest audience possible, rather than sticking to Nvidia's RTX walled garden. Whilst AMD need to develop and deliver their super resolution functionality to the Fidelity FX suite to challenge Nvidia in dynamic upscaling. Regarding the most obvious difference between these cards, the VRAM capacity, I haven't found a single game or setting that exceeds the 10 gigabyte limit imposed by the RTX 3080. Titles like Flight Simulator will allocate more, showing 12.5 gigabytes allocated at 4K for example, but there's no difference in performance indicating this size frame buffer isn't being fully utilised. Ultimately, it comes down to your anticipated lifespan and usage of the card. For gaming, even at the highest resolutions, 10 gigabytes is going to be adequate for the foreseeable future. If you like to modify games with even higher resolution textures, or just keep your cards for many years, you may feel that the 16GB VRAM capacity has more value to you. Users who need a GPU for more than just gaming, for 3D content creation or data analysis, or to accelerate rendering, should look closely at benchmarks specific to their usage case. There are some functions that the RX 6800 XT performs better at, and if you need a very high VRAM capacity, then this or the 6800 are the cheapest way to get 16 gigabytes. It also offers better compatibility in Hackintosh and some Linux applications. However, for most tasks, the versatility of CUDA and Tensor cores combined with a higher bandwidth memory access makes the 3080 a great choice. Finally, the choice may well be out of your hands. If you come across the opportunity to buy any of these cards at a non-ridiculous price, then they will both provide an excellent high-end gaming experience and they'll stand the test of time. I hope you found this review of the performance of these two cards useful. Please like and subscribe if you did, and keep an eye out on premium builds. We've got some great new content coming, and we're making major revisions to our website to really make it an exciting resource for anyone looking to build a PC.